today is going to be a little bit different because it's a little bit different of a book for me. I do read nonfiction on my own, but this is the first time that I have decided to do a nonfiction review for you. And that's because nonfiction reviews are hard. It's not like a fiction book where an author comes up with an idea, has to hit certain plot points, has to have a key event, an inciting event, and you just have to keep the story moving forward. I mean, every book does need to follow that formula, but obviously nonfiction is truth. And so it's not like, oh, wow, the writer could have had a better idea here could have executed better there. And so it's just a little bit difficult or a little bit different to talk about a nonfiction book. However, I'm gonna try because I just think this is a really important book. The book is I Have Lived a Thousand Years by Livia Bitten Jackson. And it is her account of being a Holocaust survivor. Now, if this is a trigger for you, you are free to leave. I will not judge you. I will completely understand. Not everybody's a weirdo like me. I have this strange fascination with the Holocaust. Uh, my grandfather was in World War II, but that's really the only connection I have to it. And even though like every American, possibly just every person who's ever lived, well, since World War II, I was taught about World War II and the Holocaust, but I had no real connection to it. And it was not until I was in high school that I had to read Night by Eli Wiesel and it changed my life. Ever since then, I'm like a magnet. I cannot resist a good Holocaust story. I think also it's because I'm a student of human nature. It's probably because I'm a writer, but I love to know how people tick. I want to know what makes them do what they do. And the Holocaust is, for me, a shining example of something I cannot understand. I just don't understand how one man can rally millions, or maybe not millions, like thousands, into hating a people group. I understand there are a number of people groups that either currently or in the past have been discriminated against. I don't understand that either. We are all people, okay? Color of the skin makes no difference. We are all people. And I know that there's always been this sort of ill will towards Jews. I think it harkens back to biblical times and we're not going to get into that, but I know people have not necessarily loved the Jews. But how can one man come into the picture and convince tons of people to eradicate a people group. Like, I don't know how you can fan that flame to that extent. Anywho, I have lived a thousand years. If I could compare it tonight, I would say it falls short as a Holocaust book. I'm not trying to be offensive, but if you read the two, you will see they're very different. Like, the writing... I've been trying to figure out what it is about I have lived a thousand years that I could not get into. Because you can never say a Holocaust account is a boring story. But I think the problem is the execution. Night, I felt like I was there. This book felt more like a documentary to me. Now, I love documentaries, and I think they're incredibly interesting. But if you watch a documentary, we have the story, we have the narrator. The narrator talks about the story. It tells us what happened, but it doesn't necessarily put us in the story. And so while there are instances in this book that I felt like I was really in it, for the most part, I felt extremely removed. And that's just not my favorite way to experience a novel. The writer was actually born as Ellie Friedman. And she is of Hungarian Czechoslovakian descent. So she is 14 when she goes to a, a concentration camp. And so if you know anything about the Holocaust, about World War II, you know that certain countries, certain people groups were affected 
at various points in in the war, I guess. And so Hungary was one of the last to kind of be invaded, and the Hungarian Jews were kind of some of the last to really be shipped off. And so she does not go to a, a concentration camp until 1944. So if you know anything, they were liberated in 1945. So I think that's kind of interesting. This is one of the only accounts that I've read of somebody who really, I mean, any time is too much time in a concentration camp. But it's one of the only accounts that I've read of somebody who, who wasn't there from the beginning, who wasn't there for a, a, a stretch of time. And let me tell you, there is, if you read the book, there is basically a timeline in the back so that if you kind of lost track of things, you can go back and look and, and it'll tell you, all right, so this is when this happened to me, and this is when this happened to me, and this is when this happened to me. I was appreciative of that. One of my questions was, how does she know these dates? And it's probably just because she went back and researched the dates, because I'm sure that in the beginning, yes, she knew this is when I had to give up my bicycle. This is when I had to start wearing the star. This is when they sent me off to a um, a ghetto. But from kind of like maybe the ghetto all the way to the concentration camp, I'm pretty sure she was not keeping track of her days. She has basically all of her rights and privileges stripped. They send the, the Hungarian Jews to a ghetto, and then apparently they're sent to another ghetto. I'm not quite clear. But at one of these, and they're only in the ghetto for like a month, month and a half, all of the men of a certain age are taken to go to a work camp, and that includes her father, and this is the last time she sees her dad. And then the women and children and, you know, younger men and, and the elderly are shipped off to a concentration camp. And I've lost track. Like, she went to probably three or four different camps. I know at one point she was in Auschwitz, but uh, I, I I can't even pronounce so many of these names that I'm just not going to try to even tell you what they're called. But when they first get to a concentration camp, so it's herself, her mother, her mother's sister, and then her brother, Bubby. It's B-U-B-I, so I don't know if it's Booby or Bubby, but we're going to call him Bubby because I don't really want to say booby the whole time. So, and her brother, Bubby, who is 17. They are then divided. And she is only 14, but because she has blonde hair and blue eyes, she is allowed to go with her mother because if you are younger than 16, you'd be sent to the gas chamber. She and her mother are allowed to live. Her aunt is sent to the gas chamber, and then her brother is sent somewhere else where wherever they're sending them in. So that's kind of the last time that she sees Bubby for a really long time. So we all know what happens. You know, they have their hair shaved, they're washed, they're given a shirt, uh, a pair of shoes, whether they fit or not, and then they're sent on to be counted. And honestly, they don't even know what's happening. However, they do run into an aunt and two cousins. The mother has sort of lost her will to live. And let me go back. She and her mother don't really have a great relationship. Her mother prizes Bubby over her, I guess, because she doesn't think that Ellie is pretty enough. She doesn't have the right kind of hair. Now, as she goes through this process, their relationship changes, and she has to become the caretaker. And through all of this, her mother begins to respect her and to value her. So her mother has sort of lost the will to live, but with the appearance of her sister, it makes things a little bit better. But obviously, as you can understand, the transition to concentration camp life is difficult because even in the ghettos, it had food, they had water, they had shelter, they had home comforts. As soon as they're sh shipped off from the ghetto to the camp, it's been days without water, days without food. There is still no food, still no water until the next day. And even what they are given, it's just not fit for human consumption. They're going through this. I can't really tell you how long they're at this camp, but the aunts and the cousins. So the thing is about being in the camp, you know, when you have to stand, you have your roll call, it's, you're in a row of five. And then when you're in your row of five, they give you this bowl of nasty mush and something to drink. And 
it's better if you're in a group of people you know because the the food is more evenly distributed. It's just easy because you kind of can live your life with this group of five people. So the aunt and the cousins um, are planning on switching places with some people in Ellie's bunkhouse so that they can all be together but right before they can do that Ellie and her mother are shipped off to another camp which is where they do I guess some prep work for more more bunkers you know more places for more prisoners to to stay here's a point where there's an event that I really wish would have been explained a little bit more and this just goes along with her writing that I wish that she had had done better because as I said she must have done some research to know the dates of when they were moved when certain things happened and so I, I know that this is a reflection upon her experience not putting me into her experience so while 14 year old Ellie or any of the women in the concentration camp would not have understand what they're seeing. Reflective Ellie or Livia Bitten Jackson does know. And so I, I would have accepted a little side note of this is what was happening. We didn't know it at the time, but this is what it meant. So as I said, they're at this new camp and um, they're, they're digging and there is a day where they have been dreading a selection because uh, at one point it was raining so hard that they could not do their work. So they went to take shelter and the Nazis considered it sabotage. And that's something else that I wish she would have explained better. We understand what sabotage means, but to the Nazis, I don't know. I mean, because anything could be sabotaged to them just because they were inhumane. Like, they were trying to exterminate an entire people group. They didn't care if they were treating these people badly for no reason whatsoever. So anyways, um, not doing their work was considered sabotage. So there was going to be a selection as punishment. And a selection is where a, a certain percentage of the workforce was going to be killed. All the women are, are super worried about who it's going to be. And Ellie is positive that she or her mother were going to die in this selection. And it's supposed to happen the next morning, and it doesn't. And what they see is that the flag is at half-mast. And so they're all thinking, oh, hey, Hitler's died. But me, knowing the date, because... All the chapters start with a, a, a reference of time. I'm like, uh, pretty sure Hitler hasn't died yet. So they have really no clue what happens. All I know is that the flag is at half mast, and whatever is going on has distracted the SS enough not to come and perform the selection. And so I just, I wish at some point, even, even in the back, when she gives us the timeline, I wish she had said, so, this is why the flag was at half mass. This is what happened so that they decided not to shoot this many people from our workforce. And also, there was a point where, or actually two instances, where they're working and new people are brought in. And it's, you know, this part is really impactful. Anytime we get this juxtaposition of prisoners versus new inmates, because She's like, they are actual people. They have not come to this d determination like that they're worthless. You can see there's a distinct difference between people who have been in the camps, I mean, except for the obvious difference, between those who are coming to the camps. And so she will see new prisoners brought in, children, men, women, in their fine clothes and whatever, and then she'll see them murdered. And, and my, my problem with this is, who are they? Because my knowledge is not that great that I could know which kind of, which kind of Jews are now being brought into the concentration camps, you know, like six months before it's all over. Are they still the Hungarian Jews? Are they Jews from Holland? Or 
are they even Jews? Because I know there was a certain point where it didn't really matter if you were Jewish or not. Like, they had a criteria, and they're like, you meet our criteria, and so we're going to take you. So I was like, I really wanted to know who these people were. Were they just people who had hidden Jews? You know, and now that they were going to pay the consequences? Like, who were these new people that were being brought in? So they are there. And they were moved to a number of camps. I know they were at Auschwitz for a moment, um, but I, that's another thing I wish we had been told at some point in this storytelling. Why were they moved? There was one move she did sort of explain, and that was a percentage of the women were brought to a town to help build uh, parts for the German army. And this was the, where they were treated best. Oh, there was just another moment here that was so beautiful. Because, oh, there were actually very many moments. One was when they, uh, they get off of the train. And they have no idea where they're going. They have no idea what's happening. But her mother had been injured. And so she was partially paralyzed. And so she could not keep up with the group. And one of the guards is like, can you not keep up? And she's like, no. And the guard's like, what is your name? And the mother gave her her number. And the woman was like, but what is your name? And that was something that really stuck with Ellie because this guard, this woman viewed them as people. And it's like, it's been so long since anybody honored my mother enough to call her Mrs. And then to call her by her name, not just number XYZ. But there was this moment where they were given new clothes and they were all just loving the luxury of these fine um, dresses and coats. And Ellie looked in her coat and saw a name and a town stitched into it. And she realized this is a coat from somebody from another Jew. They took this from her. And she, she may be dead now, but they've taken this from her and then they've given it to me. So now I'm benefiting from the spoils of war and I can no longer love this coat. And so those were really some of the moments that were so beautiful in this book and I wish we'd had more of. And we all know how skeletal and malnourished that prisoners were. But it's, it's those moments of comparison when we see the fresh new faces coming in or when she realizes the skeletons she had seen when she arrived were prisoner. They were people like she was now. Or when she's excited about something and then she realizes the cost that it took for her to get that. After they are sent to that town to help build weapons for the war, they're moved to a new camp and it turns out to be the camp where Bubby is. And I thought this was particularly poignant as well because they finally learn, because they, you know, there's the women's side and the men's side. And I guess they learned that there were some men from Hungary there or somehow they knew that Bubby could be there. So they go to the fence, they speak with a man who's like, yes, he is here. And so he goes, he, he gets Bubby and Bubby comes to the wall. And I'm picturing like a chain link fence. I don't really know what kind of wall it is. All I do know is they can see him, but the bread that they brought for him, they have to throw over the wall for him to get. But, you know, he went from the, being this handsome man to this emaciated figure who showed no emotion whatsoever in being reunited with them. What he would do is he would just wait for them to throw their bread over the wall. He would take it and he would leave. And here's another thing I wish had been explained is he had like a tin can or something attached to him that made noise when he moved. And I'm assuming it's so the guards would know, you know, like a cat with a bell on its collar. Anyways, I wish, like she made 
a point of pointing out this can, but she never explains the purpose of it. So it's just all these little things that I thought could have helped make the book more impactful, which, I mean, do we really want it to be more impactful? Maybe, maybe not. Anyhow, uh, so yeah, so they're there, and then at one point the mother is given kitchen duty, which is great because it means that she can kind of eat scraps, but it also means that she can't always meet him at the wall. And then, you know, it's here that he's like, well, where is she? So it, that that's also a nice little moment because we, as a reader, are so excited about this reunion, and then we're crushed when he's apathetic about it, and then just gives us a little spark of hope that he does still care when his mother cannot come to meet them. It's while they're at this camp when uh, um, word spreads that the Allied forces are coming to liberate them. Again, it's really confusing as to what's really happening. The rumors start to spread and then all of the guards disappear. So it's like the men and the women are being are able to commingle, but then the guards show back up and herd everybody into train cars and then they just start rolling. I again, my knowledge is not so great that I could understand what they're doing with these people. It's not the death march. I'm like, where are they trying to take them? Like, are they just trying to drive until all the people starve to death? I, I don't know. But so they're on these in these train cars, you know, packed in like sardines. Days pass, you know, they're not fed, they're not watered, they get nothing. And then the train stops. And at some point, someone opens up their train car door and is like, oh, hey, we're free. So people run out into this cornfield, and again, I'm having a really hard time picturing the scene. I'm imagining they're in the middle of nowhere. Uh, maybe there's a town in the distance, but anyways, I'm just picturing people scattering. People are eating the corn, people are getting out of there, and the next thing we know, the guards are there shooting at them and hurting everybody back in. I mean, from my, my frame of reference, I'm thinking that they have been on their own for hours. So, I mean, I know these people are not in the best physical condition, but how could they have not gone far enough? Anyways, so then they're brought back into the train, and they're on the way again, and then they stop at a town, and the Red Cross is there. So they're like, come to the windows, we'll give you food, and it's all really just a plot to gather them close enough that they can kill them, you know, because they start shooting. So a lot of people die, but Ellie, her mother, and her brother do survive. Uh, Bubby is injured, which again, there's just so many things that need explanation. Like when he gets hurt, he's shot in the head. So how did he survive? I mean, as far as I can tell, this was not a lasting injury. It's not something that caused him mental defect for the future. So was it really more of a flesh wound? Because again, it's, it's days more before they're actually rescued by the Allies. So the train keeps going, and then it stops again. And there, there's a point where the train has stopped, and the, the prisoners have gotten out and they see the planes coming and they're just shooting and it's attributed to the Allies. And I'm like, is it the Allies or is it the Nazis telling them it's the Allies? It's, it's very confusing. Like, there are just no answers. And I don't know if that is Jackson's way of getting us to understand how little that the, the inmates knew? If it is, she succeeded. But the final stop is where the allies open the doors and they help them out. And then this, this I thought was particularly enlightening. Something that you do not get from a lot of Holocaust books. Most Holocaust books are about fiction or nonfiction, are about my time in camp. Like the days or months leading up to camp, 
camp, and then we're liberated. And so this, I thought, is what makes I Have Lived a Thousand Years stand out from the rest. And it is because once they are liberated, you know, they, they are with Americans who do not speak their language. And uh, at some point, the Americans drive them to a town. Like, they know where they're from. Like, basically what country they're from. They, they drive them there. They leave them there with, you know, a bag full of supplies. And then the, the survivors are like, where are we? Like, they don't even know where they are. And not only do they not know where they are, but they're like, what are we doing here? What do you expect us to do now? Ellie and her family, they do make it back home, but it's not the home they left behind because anybody they had known, um, cause it's like out of a hundred Jewish families, only 35 people made it back. So anybody that they had known before, either Jewish or not, were no longer there. It's readjusting to this life of this is our home, but it's not our home. And because you know they, they go back to their house and when they had been taken to the ghetto, they were told, all right, you can bring a room's worth of furniture and X, Y, Z else. So they get home and the entire house is empty and there's human excrement inside. So it's like they're home, but they're not home. So now they have to figure out what else to do. It's decided, you know, after they had been separated, because it's like seven months that they had been in a camp. They're like, we never want to be separated again. And so the goal is to go to America because uh, an uncle lived in New York and was going to help them come over. But then Ellie had a friend who was talking about the, going, to, going to Israel. And she's like, you know what? That's, that's where I need to go. Like, I don't, I don't want to go to New York. My place is in the Holy Land. They talk it through as a family and... In the end, it is decided that they're going to go to New York. So eventually, the, all three of them end up in New York. But it's really sad because there was a point where, because as I, as I mentioned, she did run into her aunt and her cousins. She has heard rumors of gas chambers, but what inmates were told was there is a children and elderly camp elsewhere. And so she's just under the impression that all these people are somewhere else. And so she will be reunited with her family. What she doesn't know is that her dad has died. And it's not explained what happened to her family because, you know, that those cousins and that aunt don't know what happened to them if they were moved to any other camps like, like Ellie and her mother were. I don't even know how many camps Bubby had ended up at. I don't even know why they move people around camps. It's not explained. But there is a point where Bobby is like, you're not going to see any of these people again. All right? Like, they're, they're gone. We are the only ones left. And so it is really sad. It's, it's heartwarming to know that she at least did have some family make it out with her. But it's just so heartbreaking that nobody else did. And as I mentioned, all, you know, out of 100 families, you know, if you have four or five people to a family, that's four or 500 people. And only 35 returned. I mean, that's just tragic. But you are left on this uplifting note that they do come to America. And she does make a success, a success of herself. She wrote a couple books. Um, she graduated from college. She lived her life. I liked that we got some of that afterward. Where most books stop at, I'm liberated. Because we think, as Americans, we are the saviors. That we came in and we rescued the Jews and everything was great from there. But really it wasn't. Like, I mean, it's, it's, it's the same idea of Jews were trying to get to America when they realized that they were going to be persecuted. And America shut its doors. And, and, you know, these are just realities that we don't talk about. Like, we like to see ourselves as the Savior, but we're not. I mean, whether because we were truly intending to keep them out or 
just because we did not want to have open doors. But we, we could have saved so many people, but we refused to let them in for one reason or another. So I really like that we got a glimpse at how their life truly was afterward because they had no way of making money. So not only were they dropped off in a random town, and then they had to find their way back home, but once they got home, it had been occupied by the Russians. They didn't speak Russian. They had no way to make money, so they had to survive by bartering services. I mean, it's almost like just a regular prisoner, where you think, wow, man, like, life inside must be so tough. But it's even tougher reacclimating to life outside. Because the life you had before is no longer there. There is one more quick point that I do want to talk about. <clears throat> I hope it makes it in. I actually talked longer than I thought I would about this book. But it is the idea of faith. I mean, if you just imagine being persecuted because of what you believe, and then you go through these sorts of travesties, it would be very hard for me, and I feel like I have very strong faith. It would be very hard for me to see how God is with me during that time. But there are so many instances in this novel, like the, the time when they were supposed to have the selection. And remember, they have had everything taken from them. Like, literally, they have nothing. And somehow... Some girls had managed to hold on to some sort of, of religious text, some of their psalms. And so they're singing this. And for me, as a religious person, I am totally seeing this as God looking out for them. It's not explicitly stated. But to me, that's the only way I can explain the fact that nobody was killed. Because these people held on to their faith. So these young girls start singing these songs, and then all of the women in their bunk are singing these songs of faith. And in the end, they're saved from death. And, and there's just so many points where it's like, thank God, or, you know, God is referenced, God is mentioned. Uh, you know, when they're at the, the factory, they found potatoes, and all the women are eating their, their potatoes. But her mother uses her potato as a candle, um, I guess in um, observance of one of their holidays, which again, I don't know how she knew that the holiday was there, there, but in any case, you know, and so the light is seen, their commandant comes, and she gets in trouble, but she's not killed. And then the, the rest of the women are like, we want to participate in this too. And so you know, they obviously they sound a little bit smarter and they, they have lookouts to make sure that nobody is coming, but they put these candles in the windows to observe this religious holiday. Also, they if you can believe this, they choose to fast. And it's like, I, I mean, they were only there for seven months versus some who were there like seven years, if you can actually last that long in a concentration camp. I, by, at some point, I would be like, is it worth praying? Is it even worth risking my life to put a candle in a window or to fast? Like, is God really there? So I thought that was a really interesting aspect of the novel, that she would continue to reference God in conditions where I would think these people would have been convinced that God had turned his back on them. I hope you enjoyed this review. It turned out to be a little bit better than I'd expected. I would recommend this book. I would definitely tell you that it's not the most emotional book, it's not the most evocative book, but it is an interesting book. And it really gives you a sense of first world problems. You know, like, your life could be worse. I know things can be bad, especially during COVID. It's not ideal. But hopefully you get three square meals a day and you have a bed and you have a, a roof over your head. Like, 
I do wish that I'd gotten more historical background and explanations for why people were moved around versus just saying, oh, well, we were put on a, a cargo train and, and they sent us here and they made us do that. And then, and then, you know, they sent us somewhere else and then they sent us somewhere else. And, um, that, that's really, that, that bothered me because I like to know. Which is why I have a spoiler review, because I, I like to share everything. <laughs> Let me know what you think. Let me know if you have any uh, favorite Holocaust books. Have you read Night? What did you think of it? Did it make you weep as well? Uh, I'll see you later. Bye.